You would know him even if you'd never read one story or listened to a single radio show. The maniacal laughter, the hawkish silhouette, the foreboding sound of organ music, and the question. A distant echo coming from somewhere, but at the same time from nowhere in particular. You would know him because he's part of the fabric of America. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The question was rhetorical. He knew. Case number 21, The Shadow, Pulp Hero. Today, on The Noir Factory. Noir. Suspense. True crime. Hard-boiled fiction. Explore the dark alleys and cheap gin joints of mob history, noir films, hard-boiled paperbacks, and two-fisted pulp fiction with mystery writer and make-believe detective Stephen Gomez. Grab your fedora and button your lip as you enter the office of the Internet's finest fictional detective agency, The Noir Factory. Savage in the Shadow was one of absolute values, where what was good was never in the slightest doubt, and where what was evil inevitably suffered some fitting punishment. Alan Moore, writer. The Shadow first cast its presence over the airways on July 31st of 1930. It was on CBS's The Detective Story Magazine Hour, where a mysterious narrator introduced a dramatic story that appeared in the latest issue of Street and Smith's Detective Story magazine. Back then, the shadow was merely a storytelling device, a mysterious identity to bookend a detective story. I am the shadow. Conscience is a taskmaster no crook can escape. It is a jeering shadow even in the blackest lives. The shadow knows. And you too shall know if you listen as Street and Smith's Detective Story magazine relates for you, yada yada yada. The intro was followed by a hard-boiled detective story, and each episode ended with a now famous maniacal laughter. The stories were pedestrian, but the narration struck a chord with the audience. His mysterious voice and the background music made a promise to the listeners. The promise was of adventure, intrigue, and action. Sometimes that promise was a little hard to hold up, and the show was canceled after only 52 episodes. That mysterious narrator, however, lived on to narrate the Blue Coal Radio Review and Love Story Hour. The mysterious narrator eventually went on to have his own show, The Shadow, but he continued to serve as a narrator to bookend the stories. The first person to fill The Shadow's wide-brimmed fedora was voice actor James Lacuerto, but he was almost immediately replaced by another voice actor, Frank Riddick Jr. And much to the surprise of Street and Smith, the radio show producers and magazine publishers, the character of the Shadow soon became more popular than the hard-boiled stories he narrated. In 1931, CBS also aired Love Story Hour, which was produced by Street and Smith and was narrated by the Shadow. Love Story Hour moved from CBS to NBC and ran twice a week, providing enough voice work for Lacuerdo and Reddick. But the show eventually ended up on the Mutual Network in 1937, what were sponsored by Blue Coal, the clean burning coal. The audience of Detective Story Magazine Hour and Love Story Hour asked for, hell, they demanded the character get his own magazine title, and Street and Smith were too happy to accommodate them. The publishers brought in Walter B. Gibson in 1931 to create the shadow and to turn him into a character the public was hungry for. Gibson was a former newspaper man, and he was used to getting stories turned in quickly. He was also an amateur magician who knew and worked with the great Harry Houdini. Gibson wrote articles on Houdini as well as on sleight of hand magic. He served as a ghostwriter for the greatest magicians of the Golden Age. Names like Houdini, Thurston, and Blackstone. Walter B. Gibson was well versed in card tricks, rope and knot magic, and in paper sleight of hand. He had an exceptional memory 
And more than anything else, he understood the advantage of misdirection. He started working on the shadow under the pen name of Maxwell Grant. And for those not in the know, they could be forgiven for thinking that Maxwell Grant was a publisher's house name. It was common for pulps to use house names that other writers could work under. After all, The Shadow began as a quarterly magazine, and that very quickly turned into a twice-monthly magazine. Each issue of The Shadow carried a 75,000-word story, or in effect, a mini-novel for its readers, twice a month. That came to was roughly 24 novels a year at roughly 10,000 words a day, which was way more than anyone would ever ask from a writer, present day or otherwise. But Walter B. Gibson felt differently. Gibson was prolific in a way few writers are. In addition to the over 100 books on magic, he wrote 282 of the 325 shadow novels, at times to the tune of two a month. Quite simply, the man loved to tell stories, and as Maxwell Grant, those stories were dark and mysterious. On the rare occasion, another writer would don the chapeau of Maxwell Grant. From 1936 to 1943, Theodore Tinsley was hired to write four shadow novels a year, a snail's pace compared to Walter Gibson. In addition to Tinsley, another young pulp writer, Lester Dent, would go on to write a sort of tryout novel for Street and Smith to see if he was good enough to trust with another featured property. Lester Dent had the chops, and he would go on to write over 159 Doc Savage novels over 16 years. And while Lester Dent is a pulp writing legend, in the same class as Gibson, the narrative for The Shadow was quite different from Doc Savage, and Gibson was asked to give Dent's story a final once-over so that it read more like a shadow novel. As The Shadow became a sensation in the world of pulp fiction, on the airwaves, he rose to even greater fame. On September 26, 1937, The Shadow, radio voice for Street and Smith, began a new chapter on the air. No longer was he a narrator, but now he was the main character, a mysterious creature in black who struck fear in the hearts of evildoers everywhere. And now, the creature in black had a new voice, that of Orson Welles. In the 1930s, Orson Welles started making noise around the American theater in a way that actors just don't anymore, or even really back then. Welles was born in Wisconsin, and he had a troubled childhood. When he was about 18, he traveled to Ireland, where he learned a little about stagecraft and a lot about chutzpah. He got his first job in Ireland at the Gate Theater after telling the manager he was a Broadway star. The manager, incidentally, didn't believe the kid for a minute, but he liked his attitude, and he gave him a job. The kid learned everything he could about theater, and that natural bravado gave way to a very natural talent. He came back to the U.S. via England, and he made a splash working for the Federal Theater Project. The project was part of Roosevelt's New Deal that brought theater and art to the forefront of American culture, and it put food on actors and writers' tables during the Depression. Wells was ever the risk-taker on stage, and he gained the notice of critics and theater-goers alike with a production of Macbeth featuring an all-black cast. Years down the road, Orson Wells would go on to cinematic immortality with a whisper, as well as scare the pants off the eastern seaboard with an invasion. But that'll have to wait for another day. The Noir Factory has plans to spend some time with Mr. Wells in the future. But for today, we want to talk about young Orson Wells and that mysterious creature in black. Orson Wells was 22 years old on September 26, 1937, when he took up the cloak and the fedora of the strange creature. But this time, the creature was a little different than he had been before. Mirroring what was happening in the pulps, the shadow was no longer a mere narrator, but he was a mysterious man of action. And with Wells at the helm, the shadow was instantly a compelling radio presence. Wells was an unknown in film and radio, but he was the greatest actor of his generation, and the guy could act the phone book. So he brought his talents to the shadow, success was all but certain. And while there were certain elements in common with the shadow from the pulps, The radio version was meant for family entertainment. It was good, old-fashioned American entertainment. And if evildoers met their end, it usually came from their own actions. Or as Wells put it, the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. And the listeners knew, and they believed. 
Will stayed with the Shadow for the fourth season until the War of the Worlds broadcast made him a household name in the next year, and he left for Hollywood. And even though he stayed with the show for only one season, he is the voice actor most closely associated with the Shadow. For season five, Bill Johnstone joined the cast as Lamont Cranston, the Shadow's alter ego, and Agnes Moorhead, later of Mercury Theater, and later still of Bewitched, continued as Margot Lane, the, sh- the Shadow's sidekick. Johnstone was an active voice actor and went on to many film and television roles, including over 20 years on As the World Turns. He was the radio voice of The Shadow from 1938 to 1943 when Brett Morrison took over the duties. Agnes Moorhead remained on the show as Margot Lane until 1940 when Marjorie Anderson took over the part. Despite the role of The Shadow being so closely tied to Orson Welles, It was actually Brett Morrison who logged the most time in as the voice of mystery. Morrison was the shadow almost consistently from early 1933 to 1944, and although his delivery was much less sinister than Wells, his voice was very distinct. As the shadow's fame grew on the air, sales of the pulps also increased. The radio show and the pulps went into World War II as popular as ever, but the war touched everything in American culture and the mysterious creature in black was no exception. Paper was rationed during the war. Paper was rationed during the war, and the shadow pulps went from twice monthly to monthlies. After the war, the shadow magazine combined with mystery magazine for a monthly publication, cutting the shadow stories in half. These digest stories were written by Bruce Elliott, but before long, the magazine returned to its former format, a bit quarterly, with Gibson back in the writing chores. The last issue of the quarterly magazine was published in the summer of 1949. The Shadows saw life again as a series of original paperbacks from Belmont Books from 1963 to 1967. Walter B. Gibson wrote many of these stories, but other writers took over under the byline of Maxwell Grant. In the 1940s, Street and Smith took advantage of a new medium and introduced the shadow to comic books and daily newspaper strips. The strip was a syndicated offering, and it ran two years before it too fell victim to World War II paper shortages. Between pulp and newspaper rationing, the war was not kind to the shadow. The comic book series, The Shadow, ran for over 100 issues and stopped in 1949 when Street and Smith ran into financial problems. The character of the Shadow took a few spins on the racks of comic books, but none of them ever lasted. DC Comics published The Shadow Strikes for 31 issues in 1989, and later DC tried another very adult version of The Shadow, this time by Howard Chagan. In the 1990s, Dark Horse published a movie tie-in and their own series, and in 2012 Dynamite Entertainment published a faithful run of The Shadow, but the comics never seemed to fit the character well in a way. In reality, the Shadow had been around comics for over 50 years. Think of characters like Darkwing Duck, if you will. Think of V for Vendetta. And if you look at Laurent Cranston, you can't help but see Bruce Wayne. But like the comics, television and movies were a hard fit for the living Shadow as well. In 1931, Universal released six short films featuring the Shadow in his role as a narrator. The first of these films was voiced by Frank Riddick. Later, Grand National Pictures released The Shadow Strikes and International Crime, both featuring Rod LaRocque as the Man in Black. In 1940, Columbia Pictures produced a 15-chapter serial called The Shadow, where the living shadows matched wits with the Black Tiger, a master criminal and saboteur. And in 46, Monogram produced a trio of B-movies starring Kane Richmond, The Shadow Returns, Behind the Mask, and The Missing Lady all featured a hero who was shadow-like in nature. In television, The Shadow didn't fare much better. Twice in the 50s, television producers made stabs at a Shadow series, but nothing really came of these attempts. 
The biggest push for a big screen shadow came in 1994 when Universal produced The Shadow, a huge budget spectacular. The film starred Alec Baldwin as Lamont Cranston and Penelope Ann Miller as Margot Lane. Part adventure film and part comedy, the movie was panned by critics, didn't produce the sequels the studio hoped for. But the film lives on as a cult classic, along with The Rocketeer and The Phantom. Currently, the rights to The Shadow are held by Condé Nast, and the future of The Living Shadow remains... unclear? And that covers the history of The Shadow from radio to print to cinema, and that also makes it tempting to close the book on Lamont Cranston, The Shadow. But we'd be wrong to do that, because there's still one burning question that needs to be addressed. No, it's not the whole who knows what evil lurks thing. We've got that covered. What we haven't mentioned is the name Kent Allard, and you can't have a shadow episode without covering Kent Allard. And why is that? Because Lamont Cranston is not the shadow. Kent Allard is. Hi, Steve Gomez here. Like a good mob boss, we at the Noir Factory put a lot of thought and planning when we pull a caper. We'd like to keep our ear to the ground, so to speak, and we want to know what you would like us to cover in future episodes. Drop us a note on Facebook or Instagram and let us know what we should be keeping tabs on. And head over to thenoirfactory.com today and sign up for our newsletter, giving you the skinny on what we're up to, what we plan to do, and what we're doing this very second, right under your nose. Simply put, if you haven't signed up for the Noir Factory email newsletter, then you're in the dark, and we all know what bad things can happen in the dark. We now return you to this week's crime, already in progress. On the radio, Lamont Cranston was the shadow, the strange creature in black with the power to cloud men's minds. He waged a war on crime, aided by his trusted companion, the beautiful Margot Lane. For the radio audiences on Sunday evenings from 1938 to 1954, that was gospel. But in the pulps, under Walter B. Gibson, the story of the shadow took a different turn. For Gibson, the shadow was in fact World War I flying ace Kent Allard. Allard, also known as the Black Eagle, named for successful night missions, was recruited to work for Allied intelligence. During World War I, Allard landed behind enemy lines and helped POWs escape and mapped out enemy bases. It was said that during this time, Allard suffered a disfiguring injury, causing him to hide his face behind the now trademark crimson scarf. During the war, Allard traveled to Russia and joined a secret society and became a favorite of Tsar Nicholas II, who showed his favor by gifting the aviator with his famous girasol ring, the focal point of his hypnotism. Others say he gained the stone from the eye of a jeweled idol. After the war, Allard traveled the world under various identities. He toured Europe under the guise of Clifford Gage, English explorer, and he moved through Asia as a mysterious Ying Ko. Sensing that New York was a hub of underworld activity, and why wouldn't it be, he traveled there and he set up a new identity, that of famous world-traveling playboy Lamont Cranston. In the pulp, Allard corners Cranston, who's an international criminal, and offers him a choice. Give up his identity and his wealth and leave the United States or face justice. And justice, for any incarnation of the shadow, was not a pretty thing. Cranston left the U.S. and he moved to Europe, but in the pulps, he occasionally turns up as a thorn for the shadow. Fighting a war on crime, Allard, as the shadow, enlists many operatives in his network. Those operatives were handled by his lieutenant, Harry Vincent, and coordinated by Claude Fellows, his communications officer, and later still by the mysterious Burbank. Why Gibson enjoyed telling a quick-moving yarn, with over 300 stories and 21 seasons of simultaneous radio scripts, things were bound to get messy. First off, the radio show, unlike the Pulps, were geared towards a younger audience. On a Sunday night at 7.30, the shadow uses hypnotic ability to cloud men's minds. In the Pulps, the shadow was just as likely to use his twin 45s. Also, the radio show had both time restraints and a limited cast. All the action took place in New York, while the shadow of the Pulps could travel anywhere, and he could do anything. In the Pulps, the shadow had a vast network of agents. On the radio, things needed to be simpler, 
The Shadow has faithful companion, Margot Lane, who made her initial appearance on the radio before she became a featured character in The Pulps. But mostly, the radio dramas had 22 minutes without commercials, and they wanted to keep things moving. Instead of the Shadow being a World War I ace pretending to be Lamont Cranston, they just made him Lamont Cranston. How did Cranston gain those mysterious powers? Well, that was part of the mystery. As the stories went on, the lore of the radio and pulp shadows began to mix to the point where Kent Allard is a piece of the puzzle rather than the whole picture. But put it all together, and the picture of the shadow, no matter how you view it, is still filled with darkness and vengeance for the wicked. And heaven help the guilty. That closes the books on this case. Join us next time on the wrong side of the tracks at the Noir Factory as we look at the best in true crime, noir, and hard-boiled stories has to offer. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then please subscribe on iTunes and leave an honest review. And be sure to stop by the website to fill up on pulpy and hard-boiled goodness. And remember, nice guys finish last. Still there? This week's special Noir Factory Dakota message is coming right up. Crack the code by visiting the noirfactory.com backslash key. 20, 10, 3, 12, 23, 22, 8, 3, 23, 16, 11, 3. That is all. For the key to this code, go to the noirfactory.com forward slash key. Good night.